Hi, I'm Gail Kroll from the New Cumberland First Church of God. We're glad that you joined us today for worship. I want to quickly call attention to the information in the description area of this YouTube video. You can find general information about our church and information about this specific worship service. If you would like to have a chance to chat with members of our church family, you are encouraged to join us on Sunday mornings at 1045 a.m. on our online church platform. The website for that is ncfcog.online.church. Other links in the video description include a link to our church website, links to our Facebook pages, and a link to our digital bulletin. And as usual, we truly appreciate any contributions that are made via our giving link. Any amount, large or small, can make a difference as we do our best to serve our church family and our community. Thanks again for joining us today.
His wounds have paid my ransom. Let's pray. Father, we come to you with thankful hearts as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus this Easter morning. We are thankful for Jesus and the sacrifice that he has made for each of us. I pray that you penetrate the hearts of anyone listening to this prayer right now and draw them closer to you. If anyone has not yet started a relationship with Jesus, I pray that they make a decision to do that right away. Jesus is our glory and our prize, and he is available to anyone. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in the mighty name Jesus. Amen. Good morning, and I'd like to wish each and every one of you a happy Resurrection Sunday, or a happy Easter as we tend to know it in our culture. I am here this morning seated at the foot of the cross in our church sanctuary, um, and this is uh, really the highlight of the Christian year. Resurrection Sunday, um, the death of Christ and his um, escape from death, his resurrection, are the two key points in Christianity. So as we think about our faith, um, you probably remember the movie The Wizard of Oz, and um, you know it has these characters, they're on this search to find the great Oz, who you know, could answer their questions and give them great, great wisdom in their lives and, you know, give them all this encouraging stuff. And they finally get to the, the location where Oz is located. And this Oz has been mysterious and elusive. And they finally get to where Oz is. And before them isn't Oz, but a big curtain. So, uh, and they're, you know, Oz is able to project his voice and uh, give them messages and all this stuff. And, um, But they go looking for Oz, and instead they find this curtain, and it turns out that Oz is hidden behind this curtain. And that imagery, it kind of strikes me uh, to be similar imagery that a lot of people have of God, especially the God in the Old Testament, that God is his, God is hidden. Yeah, we can gain insight and wisdom from God. We can pray and maybe get some answers and different things, but really God is very distant. And For the people that were living in the time of the Old Testament, the Jews, they especially had this imagery of God that he was, you know, foreign and distant, that he was really unknowable. In fact, if you go into the temple, you know, the temple had different layers to it and the people could, various people could go into different levels of the temple. But in the center of the temple or in the front of the temple was the tabernacle. And this was the place It was called the Holy of Holies, and it is where God resided. The Ark of the Covenant was there. The Ten Commandments were in the Ark of the Covenant, and this was like the holiest place. And this is where, um, as far as the people were concerned, this is where God lived. And kind of like the Wizard of Oz Oz movie, um, this Holy of Holies was separated from the people by a huge curtain. Um, and you'll hear me call this a veil and a curtain interchangeably, but you get the idea. Kind of like in our church, we used to have this huge red curtain that could separate the pew area from the rear seating area. Um, it's no longer there. We don't have any use for it, but anyway, that's beside the point. So this curtain in the temple, uh, the Bible gives us an indication of how large it was and translate it into terms that we would understand. It was most likely about 60 feet tall, 60 feet high, if you could picture it, that's pretty big, and 30 feet wide. Now, a big curtain like that is significant, but what really matters, uh, what would be important is, how thick was that curtain? And I could tell you, as far as I could tell, the Bible doesn't tell us how thick that the curtain was. However, Uh, You may be familiar with Josephus. He was not a Christian, but he was a Jewish historian who lived during the time of Jesus. And he wrote a lot of different things. And one of the things that he wrote, and 
this may be a direct quote. Um, I, I can't verify that for sure, but it seemed to be a direct quote when I was doing my research. The veil or curtain was four inches thick and that horses tied to each side could not pull the veil apart. So four inches thick, that's, that's really significant. You have this huge curtain, 60 feet by 30 feet by four inches thick. And you know, you could tie a rope on, a, on the two horses and have them pull on this thing and it wouldn't pull it apart. Uh, very significant uh, how thick this was. So um, this curtain shows up and you might be wondering, why am I talking about this curtain or this veil on Resurrection Sunday? Well, it's important. And let me read scripture to you and I'm gonna cover uh, multiple scripture passages this morning. I'm going to begin in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, and I'll read through verse 51. And this is with Jesus hanging on the cross. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means I'm glad they put it in English in this translation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that is a direct quote from the Old Testament that Jesus is stating there. But continuing reading, when some of those standing there heard this, <clears throat> excuse me, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So here's where this curtain shows up. And it says, at the moment of Jesus' death, the curtain in the temple that separated God from the people was torn all the way through from top to bottom. And there was no reason for this thing to be torn except that it was a miracle of God. So when we look at the Old Testament Jews, those who were living at, even at that time, they wouldn't say the word God. In fact, when they were writing things out, even scripture, they wouldn't write the word God, G-O-D. They would write G space D so that they wouldn't uh, be writing the word God because God is so holy. And I got to tell you, I really respect the reverence that people have when they do something so unique like that. Um, I don't do that, but when somebody respects God and has such reverence for God that they take a deliberate action, I think God really notices those things. And I encourage you, make specific decisions in your life. You may have heard me say that. I try to avoid setting anything on top of my Bible. Um, you know, I'm not 100% perfect in that, but it's because I have reverence for the book. I honor that book by treating it with certain respect. Um, but this is what the Jews were doing. They viewed God as being powerful, being revered, but also being authoritarian, my English again, but distant that God was not knowable. He, you know, he, you could know about God, but you couldn't know God. He was off in the distant and we were here. In fact, even the design of the temple, which comes from scripture, supported this idea. So I talked about the Holy of Holies, you know, the, the focus of where God lived in the temple and God was separated from the people. Again, this curtain separated God's presence from the people. Nobody could enter that area except for the high priest, and he could only do it on one day of the year. And then think about, this is the high priest, so you're thinking like the Pope. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't have a Pope in the churches of God, but there was one person who was chosen by God that could enter there one day of the year, and uh, that was it. The rest of the time, people could not go near God. And at the moment of Jesus' death, this four-inch thick curtain is torn in half from top to bottom. This is significant. This is a statement. This didn't happen by accident. God is near to us. Jesus dying on the cross, God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are making a statement with this curtain that God has now come near to us. We are no longer separated, as you probably are aware. You know, you have God and you have sinful people and they just, 
The sin is what separates us from God. It's, it's a wall, or in this case, it is a curtain or a veil between a holy God and a sinful people. Jesus ripped it down. Jesus literally broke down the wall that separated us from a holy God. The veil was tore. The way to God was now open. Now, the terminology I use there is significant also. The way to God was now open. And symbolically, the gates of heaven now were also open. They unlocked the, they unbolted the lock and they swung the doors open. And all those who would follow Jesus would follow him through those gates into the kingdom of God, into the heavenly realms. But this phrase, the way, the way to God, uh, if you read through the New Testament, you will see that the early Christians, you know, the ones who began the church, would refer to themselves as the way. In fact, secular people, non-Christians, would call them the way, people of the way, because Jesus is the way. Jesus is the only way to the Father. And um, Jesus made an open way for us to have a relationship, a knowable, lovable relationship with a holy God. So Jesus made God personal, personal. And if you look at the life of Jesus as you read through the New Testament, Jesus, you see him um, kind of laying this out there for us. Remember when the disciples went to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Remember how the Lord's Prayer, as we refer to it, begins? Our Father. Father is a personal term. It is one of relationship. It is one of loving relationship. For the Jewish people, there was no relationship more intimate for mankind, more personal, than the Father and the Son. And Jesus is saying to you, when you pray, say, Our Father. Now notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say what you should pray is my Father. And although that is true, that God the Father is your Father. Again, this is about the church and this is about the unity of people, the body of Christ. You are not alone in this. We are in this together. And this is why the church is so important because the church is what Jesus established and it is why instead of saying, you know, my Father, we say our Father, which art in heaven, because collectively he is our Father. Just like my siblings, my brother, my three sisters, we all share the same father, my dad. Um, so he is our father. He's, he's not my father because that would exclude them. You know, so I'm not going to keep <laughs> on that, but you get the idea. But another way that Jesus showed us this relationship with the father is Jesus was praying and he used a term. Uh, I think it's Aramaic. could be Greek. I don't know. It's all Greek to me. Uh, he says, Abba when he's talking to the Father. In fact, most of our Bibles, it says, Abba, Father. So the, the odd thing about that in the translations is Abba, when you translate it into English, literally means Father. It is this term of endearment. And, you know, I don't call my dad Father. Um, it's just not a term I really use for my dad. And probably most of us don't use a term like that. We, you know, I call my dad I used to call him dad, and then once he became a grandfather and had a bunch of grandkids, we started calling him pop. So, you know, we, everybody refers to my dad now as pop. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a term of endearment, a term of great love. And Jesus showed us that with our heavenly father, Abba, father. And again, we have to think in our society, you know, for us, I think when we use the term father, it's like a formal title where like dad or daddy or pop, they're not formal. They are intimate and personal. It's like, you know, you're not just my dad, you're my friend. We have this type of close relationship. And this is what Jesus is portraying when he says, Abba. And the Jewish people would have recognized very clearly that this meant a close personal relationship. Father, a son to his father is personal. And this is the type of thing, the type of relationship that Jesus created that you could have with your heavenly father. So Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, they completed his mission. You know, he ascended back into heaven and that, and that was good. But really his death on the cross allowed us to have the forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with the father. 
And when he rose from the dead, it showed that death could not contain him. It completed his mission. If he wouldn't have risen from the dead, and I don't know that he needed to have a physical resurrection to complete his mission, but people would be questioning it. If he died on the cross and he was buried, people would say, he's just a man. We can go there and dig up his bones. But we can't do that with Jesus because he was resurrected from the dead, a bodily, physical resurrection from the dead. So you can't go and find the bones of Jesus. They don't exist here on earth. Um, so the resurrection and the, his death on the cross are both critical. They're, uh, I described it um, in other places as they're two sides of the same coin because they're both important to the mission of Jesus. If he had only died, people would question. Maybe he was just a man, a prophet. Um, and some people in other religions do question that, that if we have faith and we believe that Jesus did die on the cross and be raised from the dead, there's no question that he is more than just a man. Jesus, by doing so, showed and proved that he is, in fact, the Messiah, the Son of God. But let's continue reading in Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to re read at verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. And let's continue down in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped, their, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. So here we see the fulfillment of God's plan. Jesus went to the cross and died. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose from the dead. The angels came down, and his church is witness to this. And if you think about it, there are literally billions of people in the world that call themselves Christians right now. And it started with this story, just a few people, a handful of people that were eyewitnesses. And we are reading eyewitness accounts of this, which makes it historically significant that the book of Matthew in particular, Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples. He was an eyewitness to all of this stuff that we're talking about. And he was taught, you know, he knew the people, the other people that were there. Anyway, um, that's great stuff. But so let's go back to the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis, we see God created man, Adam, and he created woman, Eve. So you had the first two people, Adam and Eve, and they disobeyed God and they sinned against God. And because of that, they were removed from the garden. Let's say they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and the doors to the garden were closed, kind of like the, the gates of heaven were closed at that point because now man, mankind, is sinful. It was God who was in the garden with them, walking with them, talking with them. And I would go so far as to say it was Jesus who was, took on the flesh and came down and was walking with them, who was talking with them. And they sinned and they were kicked out of the garden. But God gave mankind a promise that our relationship that now had been broken and the doors have been closed would be restored, that he would send a savior, a Messiah. 
And as we now advance 1,500 years, there are 1,500 years worth of prophecies and writings about Jesus, or about the pro uh, Messiah, excuse me. Um, Jesus is the Messiah, but they didn't use the name Jesus. So there's this 1,500 years, and then some, and finally the Messiah comes, and he is Jesus. Jesus came, and he went to the cross where he died, and he rose from the dead, fulfilling all these prophecies and this is a true miracle of God. Think about that. He was hung on a cross, like this one behind me, where he literally suffocated to death. and was bleeding. Anyway, he died. They took his dead body and put it in a tomb, and he rose from the dead. This is a miracle of God. Jesus is alive. Just like his disciples says, he is alive. Just like Jesus told, or the angel told them to tell the other disciples, he's alive. So I have a question for you. Do you believe? Do you believe this story? Do you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he is alive? If we look at John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, this is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. It says, and I'm going to take it a little bit out of context without changing the meaning of it. Jesus performed many other signs or miracles, um, Miraculous signs would be a better term here. Um, Jesus performed many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So I asked you if you believe, and really there are probably three primary answers you can give to this question. And I know there, there's always some other answer out there, but your answer is either yes, I believe, or no, I don't believe, or somewhere in the middle. You know, I'm not sure. I, I believe parts, but I don't believe other parts. I want to believe, but I don't really believe, or, you know, there's some mixture of uncertainty in the middle. But we are called and asked, do we believe? If we believe, as John writes in his gospel, and John is an eyewitness to all of this, if we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that he was, in fact, raised from the dead, we will have life in his name. And you often hear me say, if you attend our worship services, belief here is an action word. It's not just an intellectual property, like, yeah, I believe. You know, I believe that I could dunk a basketball at some point, but... Um, and if I don't actually dunk a basketball, do I believe it? Well, to be honest with you, I don't believe I can dunk a basketball, but um, that was just an example. Uh, <laughs> um, but the thing is, belief is an action word. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. So there is work for us to do. We are called to repent and turn from our sinful ways. We are called, once we do believe, to be baptized as believers, and we are called to love other people, to serve other people to make less of ourselves, to humble ourselves, to make more of what God is doing. So, you know, there's always more work that we can do. We're never, we never seem to be perfected, but if you believe, or if you want to believe, I, I would ask you to pray with me. You know, you could pray to yourself silently where you're at, and I'll pray out loud, um, but tell Jesus where you're at. And if you don't believe, tell Jesus, I don't believe in you. Prove yourself to me. If you're in the middle somewhere and you, you're not quite sure, say, Jesus, I'm just not sure. And God knows what you're thinking. But you communicating with God and asking these questions are a great way to get answers. It's kind of like when you're a class, uh, a student in a class. If you don't understand something, if you ask the teacher to explain it, you'll probably get an explanation that will clarify it. Um, you know, too many of us don't ask. I, I know when I was young and when I was in school, I was very bashful and shy. I would never raise my hand and say, could you explain that again? I don't understand. Um, but I should have because I would have gotten some clarification, maybe understood things better. But because I didn't do that, you have to put up with my poor English and my mispronunciation of many different words. Um, I should have asked my English teacher, what does that, what's a verb again? Um, let's pray. Almighty God, uh, for everybody that is watching this video right now and listening to my voice, I ask on their behalf that you show yourself to us. For those of us who know you, show yourself in a greater way. For those who are questioning, Lord, um, show yourself 
truly to them to eliminate their questions and their doubts, at least give them the evidence of the proof of your existence. And for those who don't believe, Lord, I, I'm, they're still watching this video, they're watching the message. So give them some information that will cause them to question their disbelief. And if we look at the history of the Bible and all of the artifacts and the archaeological digs and you know the proof of the, the text, the historicity of it, as uh, historians say, um, there's so much evidence for the proof of Jesus Christ. Lord, cause them to question their own disbelief. And Lord, for anybody who is watching this right now that wants to receive you as Savior and Lord, Allow them into your kingdom. And uh, Lord, forgive my sins. Help me to know you in a greater way, to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord of my life. I will need your help and I will need the help of the church as you perfect me as your disciple. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're gonna close our worship service with the song, Forever. We hope that you join in and sing along to the virtual recording that we made last Easter.
And now, may the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Have a great Resurrection Sunday. You know, look up to the sky, look for Jesus today, look at the sunrise tomorrow morning or the sunset tonight, and think of the blessings, the creation that God has, you know, put before you. The evidence of God is all around you. Are you noticing God's presence all around you? The curtain has been torn. You have free access to the Father. Call on the Father's name today. Go to Him in prayer. And as part of that prayer, listen. And now may God bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.